Hey, good morning, church. How are y'all? I'm Rick Ivey. I'm the senior pastor. If you've been here the last two weeks visiting and you're like, who is this one now? That's, that's me. I've been on vacation. Thank you for the vacation. I enjoyed it. Um, we are in the book of Acts today, chapter 7, and uh, we'll read verses 54 through 60. If you've got your phone and your Bible and you want to follow along, you can. It will also be up on the screen. Hear the word of our Lord. Uh, once the council members heard these words, they were in, enraged and began to grind their teeth at Stephen. But Stephen, enabled by the Holy Spirit, stared into heaven and saw God's majesty and Jesus standing at God's right side. He exclaimed, Look, I can see heaven on display in the human one standing at the God's right side. At this, they shrieked and covered their ears. Together they charged him, <laughs> threw him out of the city, and began to stone him. The witnesses placed their coats in the care of a young man named Saul as they battered him with stones. Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, accept my life. Falling to his knees, he shouted, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. And then he died. Saul was in full agreement with Stephen's murder. And um, may God bless his reading of his holy word this day. So we're wrapping up our servant leader series this month in which we emphasize the importance of servant leadership in our lives and in our church and uh, i'm really happy with how it has come along uh, if you haven't had the opportunity to hear all three of the sermons so far they are on the interwebs and you can look them up and listen to them on your way to work or whatever you would like to do uh, i started the series off with the fact that servant leaders help people to come to peace that they lead people to peace uh, that is what jesus can accomplish even in the most conflicted and difficult situations. He is our Prince of Peace, and He can bring peace to the most challenging of situations, and that's what servant leaders can help accomplish. Uh, Godfrey Hubert uh, preached on the importance of servant leaders who are willing to get off their donkeys and help somebody, right? And uh, then last week, Morris Mathis did a spectacular job of talking with us about Moses and how this servant leadership task is a holy and sacred one, and is so important. And today we are looking at the final part that we're going to do this year, which is Stephen's story, which is a wonderful one. And before we finish into that, just want to say, uh, many of y'all are far better experts on leadership. You train people on leadership, and you know more about leadership than I ever will. And we would love to partner with you, work with you, and have your help uh, when we do this again next year. So whether it is your gifting is in teaching one of the classes that we offer, or, or maybe you have a training that you would volunteer, uh, we would love to have your help. So keep that in mind. Uh, we are certainly a people trying to do the best with what we have, and we would love your assistance in this as well to make it even better. And the reason we're doing this is because the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. Uh, there are abundant opportunities when we think about the mission and the ministry of Jesus Christ. And I'm not just talking about going door to door telling people about Jesus. Uh, I'm talking about the fact that we have so many needs and so many uh, situations in our world that simple Christian ministry would make a profound effect upon. And, and y'all already know that. Uh, the leadership that we have within our church that does things like the garage sale, the pumpkin patch, the various mission projects that we do. You, you already know the difference that they make in the community, and we're always looking for ways to multiply that or replicate that or share that with the world around us. And so that's why we take some time to say, how can we train up? How can we inspire? How can we encourage other people to be servant leaders? And today's story is the story of Stephen. It's a really profound one. It takes place in the sixth and seventh chapter of the book of Acts. And um, we read the very end of the story in which Stephen's life comes to a tragic end. Well, at least it would be tragic in some people's minds, but we'll talk about the difference that it makes in a little bit. But Stephen, let's just back up a little bit and say, how, how did he even get there to a place where people were so mad at him that they would take his life in such a brutal way. And to give you a little context of the text, we say that uh, there was a point in the life of the church 
where things were going really good. Uh, this is the church in the book of Acts, early church, and they've got about 10,000 members at this point. But the committee on uh, finding problems and, and difficulties and grumbling about them had uh, found a particular problem in the church, which was that there were a certain group of widows that weren't getting fed. They were not having food distributed to them, which is an important problem. And they brought that to the early apostles and they said, hey, we've got a situation here. Uh, these widows, they need food brought to them. They need to be taken care of. And um, what are y'all going to do about it? And so the early apostles, uh, I guess, had one of the first nominations committee meetings and called a group of people. And you can read the list in the book of Acts chapter 6 of who they picked. The two of them are Philip and the other one is Stephen, and the rest of the list of names are some difficult Greek names that I'm not even going to try today. But they pick these two, and you say, well, what was the job description for food distribution? What are the skills? What are the requirements? Well, all we really know is that they give two qualities that Stephen has. It's the qualities that are very important to any servant leader. And it says the first was, Stephen is filled with the Holy Spirit, the second one is that he is faithful. Those are the two things that they say he would be perfect for the job. He's filled with the Holy Spirit and he is faithful. And filled with the Holy Spirit means somewhere along the way he's heard the good news of Jesus Christ. He has named and confessed Jesus as his Lord. He has left a life of sin and death and picked up new life in Jesus Christ, and he is faithful. He trusts God. He trusts God. He's faithful. He's not losing sleep over what's going to happen the next day. He's not anxious or worried about what might occur. He's faithful. He's trusting God. He's not worried about gas prices or inflation or whatever it is that we worry about. He is faithful, and this is who they pick. They pick Stephen. And it's a small job, food distribution to widows. Uh, that's the role that he's given. Probably not one that we think of as the most glamorous or most prestigious. And yet Stephen does it so well with such excellence that people in the community take notice of it. I mean, have y'all ever seen somebody that has a job that others consider to be kind of insignificant, but they do it so well that it's inspiring, right? Yeah. We've all seen that. And uh, this is what Stephen does. He does it amazingly well. And you would think that everybody would be happy with Stephen, but there are religious leaders at the time that are not happy. And you can go back and figure out what it is they did not like about Stephen. But the long and short of it is, because they didn't like him, because they didn't think he was doing the right thing, they come up with some allegations about him. And they use Jesus' words, and they say, he's one of those people that follows Jesus. And Jesus had said... He was going to destroy the temple, which is a misquote of Jesus, or misunderstanding of him at the very least. And so they bring him before the religious leaders, a group called the Sanhedrin. And um, when they all look at Stephen, the book says, Stephen looked like an angel, you know. And I don't know, there's a number of ways we can interpret that. But in my mind, I think Stephen was young. I think... Stephen looked innocent, and when the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders looked at him, they're like, are you saying this cute little baby is going to do anything bad? You cannot believe for a moment that he's done anything wrong, right? They're all looking at him and thinking he, he could do nothing wrong. And yet, when they give the allegations and they say, he's, he's one of Jesus' followers, here's what we think is going to happen, Stephen's given an opportunity in which he could have just walked away, you know? And there's so many ways you could look at the story and you could say, Stephen had an opportunity to get himself out of this problem, right? He, he could have walked away from it. He could have addressed the particular allegations that were made against him. He could have done all any of those things. But once again, <laughs> Stephen is filled with the Holy Spirit and he is faithful and if you've ever experienced the Holy Spirit or have God work in your life, 
one of the fruits of that, one of the results of that, is sometimes you will say things that you never imagined you would say. And I'm not talking about in tongues. I'm just saying sometimes you speak a truth that other people don't want to hear. That will happen. You will find yourself saying something and you'll get done talking. And you'll go, why in the world did I just say that? And it's not that you have some odd split personality or anything like that. It's just that God has put it on your heart that you just have to say it. And so what does Stephen just have to say? He gives a long sermon. I'm not going to read it for you. You can read it on your own. But Stephen, fantastic preacher. He starts at the beginning. He goes, y'all remember Abraham? And then there was Moses. And y'all remember Moses was in the desert. And they disobeyed God. And then, you know, y'all, he finishes his sermon in a way that is just amazingly fun. Right? I mean, usually at the end of the sermon, you're trying to give encouragement or inspire or wrap things up or... You know, tell that funny anecdote that you couldn't figure out where to put elsewhere, right? And um, I know that's what y'all do when you preach. Um, but Stephen, <laughs> verse 51, it's not going to be on the screen, but let me just read to you how he closes out his, his sermon in front of these people who he could have walked away from. He just says, you're a stubborn people. In your thoughts and hearing, you're like those who have no part in God's covenant, you continuously set yourself against the Holy Spirit, just like your ancestors did. Was there a single prophet your ancestors didn't harass? <laughs> that is fantastic. They even killed those who predicted the coming of righteous one, and you betrayed and murdered him. You received the law given by angels, but you haven't kept it. And so Stephen could have walked away. Stephen could have kept quiet. He could have not done anything. And instead, he wraps up his speech and his sermon with the words of, You are a stubborn and hard, roughnecks people. And he says, not only are you rotten, but your whole ancestry is a rotten situation. You know, he's not winning friends and influencing people. He's speaking a truth that he has to proclaim. And the result of that is, well, they, they kill him. All right. So what can we learn from Stephen? I mean, certainly not the message is how to get killed, right? We don't want that one. So what we have to look at is why? Why does this happen? Well, first and foremost, when I think of Stephen, there's nobody I think of better when it comes to the word servant. Stephen was a servant. What do servants do? They serve, right? Stephen is a servant. He's a servant of Jesus. It means that Stephen, at one point in his life, may have had hopes and dreams and ambitions, goals, things that he wanted to have happen in his life and he set all this aside because he wanted to be a follower of Jesus. He wanted to be a servant of Jesus, right? That rather than the whole life that he had being about him and his and his goals and his ambitions, he set all that aside and he said, I, I think there's a better way. I think if I follow Jesus and serve Jesus, the world around me is going to get better. And so, he puts himself in a distant third. Jesus is first. Other people are second. People like widows are going to get served by him. And then distant third is Stephen himself. And he is a servant. And it's so, so refreshing, church. Isn't it refreshing when you get to work with people that have that attitude? Isn't that a delight when you get to stand next to somebody who you don't have to worry about making it all about them? Isn't it a delight when you get to work with people that are willing to do whatever it takes to get the job done and there's no point when they go, I'm sorry, I'm too good for that, right? Isn't it a delightful when you get to work and do difficult work with people who have that attitude and have that understanding of what it means to be a follower of Jesus? It's so refreshing and I, I long for that and I hope for that. And it's a, it's a deep work. I mean, it says he is filled with the Holy Spirit. That means the Spirit worked in his life to free him from his selfish ways and his, his old ways and to become a true servant of Jesus. I mean, that's why he gets himself into the place that he gets, right? He is a servant of Jesus. Earlier today, we had the baptism, and y'all know when we welcome new members into the church, we ask them, will you uphold the church with your prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness? And uh, when I read this passage, I said, we should, 
have like an extra vowel put in there, right? And it would be in regards to Stephen. It's just a simple question of, do you know it's not all about you? Right? We could phrase it that way. Like, you'll, you're going you're gonna to help out with these things. Do you know that a life of discipleship is not about you? It's not all about you. I guess we could phrase it another way. Like, we could say, like, are you over yourself? Right? Have you gotten over yourself yet? Okay, then, you're, you're, it's time for you to join the church. I guess membership might drop off. I don't know. <laughs> right? But we, we all have that struggle, and that's what we see in Stephen. This is somebody that's willing to put Jesus first and others second and to follow in a distant third. He's a servant. Stephen was a, a servant. And the other thing that I think is important, you know, when we look at his life, is Stephen has a powerful vision of the reality that Jesus has brought into the world. A powerful vision of the reality that Jesus has brought into the world. You know, and we... We get a little glimpse of that in this passage, but I think it's something that happened more than just in this instance. I mean, when they, they come for Stephen, and if you heard me laughing while I was reading the scripture earlier, it's just always hilarious to me. That it says, it says um, in verse 57, it says, At this they shrieked and covered their ears. Together they charged him. You know, he's, he's upset them, and they're angry, and they're mad. And it says they covered their ears and charged him. I mean, what would that look like for a group of people, like to cover their ears and start chasing after you? I mean, it's almost Monty Python comical to me. And, uh, but we, we find that even in the midst of that predicament, when you have people covering their ears and charging after you, you need a, a vision of what could be. You need something beyond like your, your uncertainties and your doubts and your fears and your worries when you're faced with difficulties like that. You know, when you're going through hardships and you're going through hard times, you're facing something challenging, it's easy for us to just begin to tell ourselves a, you know, a self-fulfilling prophecy of it's all going to fail. You know, how does yours go? Like, I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to become homeless. And then if I become homeless, I'm going to have to join the circus and I'll have to sweep up elephant stuff and it'll be bad and I'll live in a box and it'll... I don't know what you tell yourself, right? <laughs> but a different vision is, is what's needed in these moments. And Stephen has that, right? It says, um, Look, I can see heaven on display and the human one standing at the God's right side. You know? Even as they are coming for him, even as they are threatening him, he says, But Jesus is still at the right hand of God. As you are a servant leader, as you're leading other people, it's great to have that frame of reference. It's great to have that point on the horizon where you say, but Jesus is at the right hand of God. You know? Because when you're leading people, they're going to have all kinds of ideas of what should happen or what shouldn't happen. They're going to have all kinds of thoughts and opinions, and you need to evaluate all of that on the basis of, does that line up with Jesus being at the right hand of God? Does that fit in with the framework that Jesus is sitting there next to the throne of God. And that's the kind of vision that Stephen had. He said, I, I can serve people. If Jesus is on the throne, then that's what I'm meant to do. If I'm going to suffer, then I still believe that Jesus is on the throne, that he's, he's there, right? He has that vision. And it's a vision of, of heaven, of, of light shining into our world. You know, if you were going to define what the church is, I would say that. I would say it is the light of heaven shining into the world. When we have Sunday schools, when we have worship, it is the light of heaven shining into the world. When we do mission projects, it's the light of heaven shining into the world. If you went to vacation Bible school as a kid, you remember it, you remember it, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. You all remember that. Surely I'm not the only one that went to Bible school What were the other verses? Won't let Satan it out. Yeah. I'm going to let that light shine. This is what Stephen's saying. I, I, I can see the light of heaven breaking into the world. And even in these difficult circumstances, even in this trying moment, that's what matters. 
And it's a really fun vision as well because normally when they talk about Jesus and the throne of God, they say he is sitting. He sitteth at the right hand of God. Y'all know that one. And Jesus is standing, right? He's not sitting, he's, he's standing. If y'all will give me just a little bit of, of room here to have some fun, I'll say, why was he standing, right? To me, it's like, you know, when I'm watching a football game, the first couple of quarters, I sit, and then when it really gets interesting, I get excited, and I stand up, and I start paying attention, right? And I think that's one way you can look at it. Another way you can look at it is from time to time when somebody says something and they need a witness, uh, you stand up, and you say, I believe that's true as well. And when we think about Jesus standing, there could be one of those two, or I don't know, you could have even more fun. You could say Jesus standing up and he sees Stephen doing what Stephen was told to do. To serve and to give your life for your enemies and to be a witness to the light of heaven. And Jesus is seeing Stephen doing everything correctly. And he's like, hey dad, dad, watch. It's working. The world's changing. People are getting it. Right? Right? And Stephen has that vision, and the rest of what he has to go through probably was a lot easier to endure because he was faithful and knew a truth greater than what was going on in that moment. It was so good for Stephen. He was a good servant. He had a vision. These are essential for servant leadership, and we're still going to run into that stumbling block of saying, yeah, but he died. He made a horrible end. And this is the point where you really got to pay a little attention because the writer of Acts gives you one little detail that makes all the difference. And it says in verse 60, Falling to his knees, he shouted, Lord, don't hold this sin against them, just like Jesus told him to. It says, then he died. And then in verse 1, Saul was in full agreement with Stephen's murder. Saul was in full agreement with Stephen's murder. Y'all know who Saul is. Saul, who became Paul, greatest missionary the world's ever known, traveled from one end of the world to the other, preaching the good news of Jesus Christ, wrote the letters that made all the difference for our faith. And there, that day, Saul is a murderer. Saul is a persecutor of the church. Paul is holding the clothes of that group as they beat Stephen to death. And there are many, many that would say Stephen's life was meaningless. He made a mistake. He could have gotten out of it. It was his fault. But to be a servant leader means that it's not about us. It's about others. And the other in this particular case is Saul. Saul who becomes Paul, Saul, whose life is changed dramatically by Jesus. And when you think about your calling, your mission, your vision for what could be, it's not about you. It's about who your life could impact. It's about your neighbors, your friends, and your family that need that vision of heaven that need to know his saving works, that need your mission and your ministry. It's about that kid in vacation Bible school that's going to go on to be a great teacher or leader or pastor or prophet. It's about the ones that you met at the garage sale. It's the one that you're going to help in the days to come. And to be a servant leader means that that is your goal to help as many people like Saul as you possibly can, and to do that with your whole heart, to say, it's not about me and my desires and my ambitions, but it's about who I can reach, whose life can be touched by what God has given me. So as we wrap up this series, that, that's my simple invitation to you. What is your life about? And would you possibly 
be at a place today where you know you need to set some of that aside so that you can focus more of your life upon the work and the mission of Jesus Christ. To look beyond the problems and the circumstances you find yourself in to see Jesus as Lord and Savior of the world and to follow him. To ask God and say, I've got these gifts in my life. How could I use them to serve you in the world that I'm a part of? So let us take a moment and pray and consider that. Oh Lord, we thank you for the word that you have shared this morning. As we reflect now on where we have been impacted by your servant leaders, where we have been led by your servant leaders, remind us of those moments, of those instances where teachers or mentors or pastors have come alongside us, guided us, spoken to us, led us, where others have been a servant leader for us. Lord, help us be that now. To the people that we meet, to the people that we serve, to the people that we might not know about, or at least not know about yet. Help us be a servant leader like Stephen, who never knew Saul, and yet Saul's life was forever changed. Lord, help us be a servant leader like Stephen who continued to share your good news until the very, very end. Help us be a servant leader so that we might be fulfilling the call that you placed with us at baptism, at our baptism. Lord, help us to be as faithful and as filled with your Holy Spirit as we can be so that we might continue in your grace and your love now and forevermore. But it's in this hope that we pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.